So, <coughs> as I was saying, that um, uh, let's begin, inshallah. So, the traditionally we talk about lataif, uh, which are these subtleties or the centers that we have to work on or to know about uh, and to have certain experiences within these centers we work to purify our souls. The ones that I'm going to use are four. Traditionally, our scholars talk about six, but I'm going to use four for uh, to make things more understandable for now. So I'm not going to talk about some of the other things that are traditionally talked about, but I'm only going to talk about four of the lataif. First is the ruh, which is the soul. That is a divine spark that's within us when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam alayhi salatu wasalam. And even after he was made, it was when Allah blew this ruh, this spirit within man. When I put my ruh in him, then bow down to him. So this ruh is very important. So this is that divine part of us that is connected to dreams and the other, the, the other world, the world of the angels, the world of the alim al-amr, the world where the all the other uh, spiritual entities are, like the Kaaba or the Lawl uh, al-Mahfuz, all those entities are on that that side of us exists in, in through the through this uh, center you can say or entity called the Ruh. So the Ruh is really what makes man man. Man is a composite of his animal self and a composite of his Ruh, which is the the real self, the real divine self. And so um, we're going to be also studying a particular verse that I want to concentrate on. We will be looking at that if we have enough time. It might take too much time to actually go into the, the details of some of the other stuff. So ruh will be, is your, is your soul. And it belongs to another world. Okay, So this is soul and this belongs to the other world. So this, we'll put this here. Uh, actually, let me take out this line because when I uh, connect things, you'll see that. Aql is your intelligence. Okay? Aql is your intelligence. Aql is what you do with what you know. So, the opposite of aql is jahil. Jahil is somebody who has no control over himself. Aql is somebody who has control over himself. He knows this is wrong and he's able to bring himself to do it. Aql means to tie yourself. In the olden days, aql was, they would tie one, the two feet of a camel so it doesn't run away. So to, what you do with what you know, this is aql. So it has two parts. One is your ilm, your knowledge, and your ability to, what you do or not do. Are you, like, if you have the knowledge, I shouldn't smoke. Are you able to do it? That's aql. Aql is the ability to follow through with your knowledge. So this is why Allah says all the time in the Quran, that don't you inna fi khalqa samawati wal ardi wa akhtilaf al layli wal nahar indeed in the creation of the heavens and the earth and in the alteration of the night and the day and then Allah says afala yaqilun do you not have the ability to do anything with what you know summun bukmun summun bukmun umyun fa hum la yaqilun they're deaf and dumb and blind and they have no aql they don't know what to they don't know they, their knowledge is of no use to them they can't do anything with it they can't bring it to practice so one of the diseases of the heart is that you have knowledge but you're not able to practice it. So uh, aql is your intelligence, uh, your in what you do with your intelligence. What you do with knowledge. Okay, that's aql. Qal is the center of this, as you can see, there's two here and then two here. Uh, qalb is the center because this is where your emotions are. Okay, this is where your emotions are. And this is also the battleground where uh, this is, and the opposite, you could say the ruh is your soul and jawarih, which is your body, your heart, your limbs, your physical body. So the opposite of your body is the Ruh, which is the other world. So you have your physical body, and in the middle of this, you have the nafs, which is your desires, you can say is how I'm going to use it here. Quran uses the word nafs in many different ways, but I'm just going to say desires, 
whims, okay, uh, and particularly uh, desires that, that part of yourself that says, I want it now. I want it now. That's one part which Allah calls ajila. And the nafs is that part of yourself that says, I am wonderful. Now how do we deal with this sense of I am wonderful? Uh, even modern psychologists have a, have a hard time with dealing with self-esteem, self-confidence. How do you tell yourself you're good? Uh, in Islam, we have a very different approach to the idea of, of I am wonderful, or I'm great, or I'm good, or, or my self-confidence. Islam has a totally different perspective that uh, I think uh, most uh, you know, people would disagree with, because what we do is we actually try to reduce this, but replace it with something else, as you'll see as we talk about this. So the battle, so aql is to do with, with not what you do with your knowledge, or to do the right things with your knowledge in terms of aql. The other would be jahil. You, can't, you, you have knowledge, you can't do anything. Qalb is where the battlefield is. Your desires tell you one thing, and that the, battles, the battle of, of what you need to do to rank. And over here I want to mention something very important. When you first become religious, for those of you that have been through this process, when you first become religious, you feel very motivated. It's easy to pray, it's easy to fast, it's easy to, to, to listen to Islamic lectures, and then all of a sudden, after one year or so, you're saying, wait, what happened to me? Uh, I don't feel like praying the same way, or my prayers are not as good as they were before. And it's not that easy for him, because that gift that Allah gives you sometimes in the beginning, especially for new Muslims, or people that just repent to Allah, and they want to now live the Islamic lifestyle, Allah makes things easy, but then as time goes by, that motivation decreases, and you're expected to do things based upon knowledge. And that's where the real journey begins, when you've passed through that motivational phase, and you're beginning to find it harder to do things that you used to find easy. And have you been through this? Have I'm going through it right now. You're going through it right now, yeah. So. So there is this phase that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts people through so Allah can give you a taste. It can be like this. And it's, it would be, it, it, but there's more than that. I mean, that's just, just a taste. But then Allah makes you do things based upon your knowledge. And so we will be concentrating on, on that uh, because things are easy in the beginning when Allah first puts you on the track or you put yourself on the track and Allah allows you to be on the track and Allah makes things easy for you. Now the battlefield is the heart. And this is why Quran focuses on the heart. Now, people will say, well, is that this pumping heart? No, it's not the pumping heart, but its residence, you can say, of this thing that we call the qalb is probably the heart because Allah says it's the heart. And But we don't mean by the pumping heart. We mean something else with it. We do know this heart is connected to our emotions. We have anxiety, you have stress. It affects the this physical heart. Now, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word heart? Because it's the only organ in your body. It's the only part of your body that has no rest. It's, uh, it's up and then down. Up and down. Up and down. All your life. All your life. It never stops. It has no rest. That way, the same way your qalb, your real qalb, your, where your battleground is between the right and wrong of your body, it's never at state of rest, in a sense. It is... It is, it, I'll show you how it gets to nafsul mutma'inna, which is a Quranic term, how we get there. But right now, I just want you to know that in general, you know, bust, qal, bust, qab, bust, qab, bust, qab, in, out, in, out. No rest, no rest. Every organ will have rest. This organ will have no rest, ever. Okay? And there is a way that Islam gives us to give this emotional part of you rest. So, uh, or put it in a state of control, actually. Uh, now, your qalb has two types of emotions, negative emotions or positive emotions. So now that I've given you this, this is the soul, aql is what you do with knowledge, qalb is your emotions, nafs is that part of you that says, I'm wonderful, I'm good, or I want it now, I want it now.
Okay, these two parts make this part called nafs. Now, nafs has many different meanings. Nafs even means any being. Like Allah says, Ya yuhannas inna khalaqnakum min nafsin wahida. But over here, I'm taking it in a specific sense used in some of the ayat of Quran. Ara'ayt alladhi ittakhaza ilaha hu hawa in that sense, okay? Jawarih is your body, okay? Now, why purification of the soul is important? Because when we look at uh, something, you look at this chart, and I'll show you what has happened in the last 150 years to mankind, okay? If you take Allah, God, uh, soul, and hereafter, as man's main concern prior to the industrial age. Because he had time, he would work from the morning till the whole time basically, right? The rest of the time he's spending with his family and in, 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 in service of worship, whether he's Christian, Jew, Muslim, no matter what he is, he's, man was concerned with this side of the spectrum, mostly. Now, uh, instead of the hereafter, it is here and now, okay, instead of the soul, it is the body, and here and now means also me, and instead of God, we're concerned with material goods, okay, material sheets, as Confucius calls it, the material sheets around us, so obviously you can see that there is a lot more emphasis on this side of the spectrum and very little emphasis on this side of the spectrum. And also when you say, I want to be motivated to do it, I want to be motivated, I want to be motivated, you're just really catering to this side of yourself. Motivation. Okay? This is actually one of the problems with Buddhist meditation. It, you, you go through a phase where basically you're Taught, you'll do things when you feel like it and you may never feel like it okay so you become lazy when you're going through Buddhist meditation that's why even in Salah our the the meditation in Islam requires willpower you know you have to get up do wudu and we're gonna talk maybe if I have time talk a little bit about that okay so you can see that man has moved shifted his pre-concern from here his pre, you know, his his uh, he's preoccupied with instead of these things, he's occupied with these things, right? He's no longer interested in God. Forget about the soul, and forget about the hereafter. Let's just worry about the here and the now. Let's make me happy, you know. Let's make sure my body looks good, right? And let's make sure I have a lot of things. So this is how things have shifted between now and then. And so the objective of a Muslim should be that how can I bring myself a little bit back here so that I can balance myself properly so that all of my human self is being and is well adjusted. Because when you're not well adjusted human being, then it's when you know it's like a it's like when you've seen those people that like are dwarfs with big heads and little bodies. I mean things go out of proportion and then there's side effects of that and what you see in the modern world with depression pills, with obesity, with all sorts of problems uh, that people are having in terms of in terms of their lifestyle. And so no one's able to find a lifestyle that's balanced and so you have all these gurus around trying to add to uh, tell people do this, this, and it also again starts with a little bit of motivation, people feel good, and then soon what you find is that people uh, feel like this really didn't help me. Or the other thing is, is that uh, some of these self-help books, they basically push you into like living your life where you're just totally focused on your career uh, and then, and then you know, your career become, you're so engrossed in one thing that you forget about everything else and then later on in life, the side effects of that hit through. Okay, so <coughs> having said this, now we're going to talk about the heart first and then we're going to talk about its relationship with the, the nafs and the upper. So whenever you're reading Quran, for example, okay, I'll come to that in a second. So you have qalb, the heart, which is in the center of uh, this whole battle, okay? 
So on top of the qalb is the ruh, and over here is the, the nafs. The qalb will either have positive emotions, or we call it sometimes higher emotions. Positive emotions, or high, I like higher emotions. Positive emotions, because they are emotions that, these positive emotions are emotions you do not expect in the survival of the fittest world, in the world of the survival of the fittest. And then, or you have negative or destructive emotions. Okay? Uh, I'll just call it negative emotions. And what, let me give you an example of what happens. And over here is aql, just keep this in mind. And I'll show you why I'm talking about this. Negative emotions are like jealousy, self-centeredness, being selfish, being envious, you know, all the negative emotions. Remember this part of you once says me, 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 right? And so when you when your nafs has control over you, when your when your animal desires, when your nafs, your I and I want it now, when those two aspects are in control of you, then they feed the al negative emotion. They feed the, ne they, the negative emotions connect to the nafs. Because you're selfish, why? Because of me, right? You're envious, why? Because of me, right? You hate because uh, I didn't get that, right? Or he didn't give it to me. So your al either has positive emotions or negative emotions. Over time, what happens is the qalb where the battlefield is, either the nafs, the nafs and the qalb become like one. If he has negative emotions, and if the nafs takes control of his qalb. At this stage, when your self takes control of your negative emotions, at this stage, you're happy with life. Because you're, uh, you're happy with life with those negative emotions and that selfishness, and you know it's bad, but it makes you happy. It actually makes you happy. You feel good. Okay, that's how you want life to be. But if you have positive emotions, being selfless, surface to other people, feeling love, feeling mercy, feeling empathy, being kind, uh, sacrificing yourself for the other, when you have these emotions, your aql, what do you do with the knowledge you have, okay, makes the aql and the qalb come together. So either your qalb, so qalb is the, you could say the, the battlefield, okay? Both your aql and your nafs are trying to take over your qalb. And depending upon whoever or whichever takes over your qalb, whichever takes over your heart, you will be that type of person. So if you're a person who's able to do something with what they know, for example, okay? And you then uh, and you have positive emotions. So the heart is also independent, by the way. It's not like just this. The qalb develops emotions based upon what it is being fed. The qalb develops emotions based upon what it is being fed or what its experience is. Like in, uh, we could say if somebody's had horrible experiences in life, that will affect their emotions. We know that. So, uh, the lifestyle you live affects your emotions, right? So, are you emotionally deficit, is one way to say it. Uh, is your emotional bank account uh, bankrupt? Uh, anyway, I won't go into all of that right now. I just want to make the point that you develop either positive emotions, like selflessness, or you develop negative emotions, like jealousy. And this... If, if this side is feeding this side, I want it, I want it, and then that translates into emotional, negative emotions. Why am I not getting it? Why am I not getting it? Right? That's what you're saying yourself. Everything is about what your brain is, and your heart, and your self, and your consciousness is saying to itself. But, we're, but the way of purification is not through dealing with that directly, as you'll see. Now, aql is, you know something is right. Are you able to... If you're able to take something that's right, or 
and I don't want to make this more complicated than it is. Or your heart already, because it's not, it's not dirty yet. It's still clean. It, because the natural state of a human being, like a baby, right, is to have positive emotions. A child doesn't come out of a mother's womb saying, uh, being, uh, being like, oh, I'm not going to trust my mother, right? It, it's, when a person is clean, they're able, uh, they're able to trust other people, for example. They have empathy. Children have empathy. Children have trust, because they have to. And so they have a clean heart which we call fitra. They're born on the natural disposition. Modern psychology says, or has been saying for a long time, there's no natural disposition. You're just contextual. You are the, the product of your environment. But we now know, like without any doubt, from the studies of body language, from the studies that we have of many, many cultures, there's a lot of, there's a lot of universals. So there is a natural disposition amongst human beings. Again, this is a whole subject in itself. But, the point is that the Qur'an was right and modern psychology was wrong. And in fact, for a long time, psychology and sociology was always saying man is a product of his society, which is partially true. It's not totally false. It's partially true. And anthropology that was looking at many, many cultures across history saying, no, 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 there seems to be too many universals. For example, all cultures respect somebody of knowledge, for example, just one example. Another example is the archetypes that Carl Jung talks about. You know, if anybody came close to the same results as anthropology did in many ways, and I'm sure that those of you that have studied psychology can relate to the idea of archetypes in many, many cultures, because the archetypes are generally all the same. We all respect the wise man. We all respect the hero. We all respect the, the warrior, right? So we all respect the saint, the concept of the saint. So whether like the warrior is a mujahid, or whether the warrior is a samurai, or whether the warrior is a knight, it's, it's the same thing manifesting in different forms in different cultures. So the point is the human being uh, has positive emotions in him either independently because his heart's already clean or because the aql which is able to do what you know. It is able to force the body to do and force the heart to do what needs to be done based upon the knowledge. So there are people that if you tell them about Islam, like Abu Bakr, when he was told about Islam, accept Islam, it made sense to him, he got the information, he was able to bring it into effect immediately. Omar was like that too, when it became clear to him, he was ready to go. But there are other people, if you tell them about Islam, they have their negative emotions in the sense of, well, what will happen if he's a priest? Well, if I become Muslim, I lose my position of becoming a priest, do I really want that? What will so, so negative emotions kick in. That's not to say he's a negative person, he may be a good person, but the battle is always going on, so, so he'll be like me, right? Me, what do I do with me? So that battle is always going on between your positive emotions and your negative emotions. Now, majority of the Muslims, our case, the case of the majority of us Muslims is we have a mixture of these. We have a mixture of some good emotions, some positive emotions, some selflessness, and also some selfishness, okay? The majority of the Muslims, their case is that we have maybe kindness, and then we also have anger, for example, okay? Again, anger, for example, one of the emotions uh, and one of the states of a human being, anger is a result of not feeling things in your control. Our body gives us a burst of energy so that we can bring things under control. So now, how do you go through a process of making, now, you, what you want is in the beginning, and I'll go ahead and talk about the next phase. Uh, when the aql, when your aql and has complete control of the qalb with all of these positive emotions, where you want to be kind, you want to be selfless, you want to sacrifice yourself, you want to stand up for justice, instead of standing up for your self-interest, you're standing up for justice, even if it is against yourself, as the Qur'an mentions. Then, when this becomes one entity, and this is what we're going to focus on today, I'm not going to go on the higher levels, but just on the basic level. How do you reach this? How do you reach this level? that how can you make your aql take over your qalb? Okay, this is the other thing. That when your qalb and your aql come together as one entity, then the heart turns towards your ruh, your spirit, your soul. It turns to the other world. Okay? When the qalb has negative emotions and 
it's trying and it's controlled by your nafs. Or the situation of Muslim Muslims when it's in between. Then the qalb is facing here and facing there. But mostly facing here. Because it takes a lot to make the heart face there. So when the when you are beginning to face your, your aqal and your qalb, your positive emotions and your aqal, your ability to do what you have to do, when they dominate your nafs, they dominate, so they come together and they dominate over your nafs. Okay? Or if you have negative emotions, then your nafs and your qalb dominate your aqal. You're not able to do what you know you're supposed to do. So if you have negative emotions, your heart is looking, oh, what do I want, what do I want, what do I want, me, 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 and I want it now. Okay? When your qalb has positive emotions, and your aqal has control over the qalb, then your qalb begins to look upwards. Just like human beings, I talked about this in uh, Yasin. We either looking upwards or we're looking to dominate the ground. So the same thing. So either you're looking to dominate and to give your, feed your soul, right? Like they say, feed me, I'm hungry, just do it. All these slogans, right? They're all about feeding the nafs. Okay, so when a person's, and this is just to motivate you, just to give you an idea, because we live in a world where people are not even aware of this. Now, some things will become more clear. When your qalb, when your aqal and your qalb to get, become together, and they have been together for so long, that it's almost like they become one entity. Okay? You're like in that state. It's not like a temporary state you go to. But you, have, you are consistently in a, with the positive emotions. You get angry, like Omar got angry. It's part of his character. But he gets angry for the right reasons. Or he tries to get right, right, angry for the right reasons. Your character will not change. But how you channel those, those emotions and those energies will change. And what you get angry for will change. So when those positive emotions and aql, they start looking at the ruh, then your character begins to look more, more and more like an angel. You become connected to the world of the angels. We are your friends in this life. The angels, they say this. The angels come down upon them. And in their heart, there is a feeling. And there's many ahadith about this. That when Allah loves someone, He tells Jibreel. Jibreel tells the other angels. The angels, then they tell the, the other parts of the creation. Allah loves this person. So that happens when your qalb and your aql are facing towards the ruh. This is the phase where when he goes to sleep, he has true dreams. This is one seventieth of prophethood, according to one of the narrations in Sahih Bukhari. So his qalb and aql take, uh, when they are as one, and his qalb is faced towards the ruh, then his character becomes more and more like an angel. You know, angels are perfect, right? You, people talk about, oh, why is there suffering? Because it's not a perfect world. There's no suffering in the world of angels, right? So. Uh, when you have a group of people that are like angels, then the world will become more perfect. But that's a choice we make to either be here like animals, then we'll see survival of the fittest. Or we can be like the angels, and then we will be in harmony. And if human beings are in harmony, then other things will automatically be in harmony. Okay? So now, when you reach this stage, you will now begin to... Uh, so the person who is here is very, very different. You know, like animals, if you have ten horses, they look all the same. They have different personalities, of course, but they're still relatively the same. They look the same, they have the same food, same everything, same instincts. But human beings, between Abu Bakr and Abu Lahab, between Abu Bakr and Fir'aun, you have, they're the same human being. They look the same, for the most part, but they are totally different beings. This person that's like Fir'aun is basically a zombie. He's dead inside, living outside. And Abu Bakr is, he's living on the outside, but maybe not as strong on the outside. But he's completely living on the, in, the, in the inside. So human beings are very wide and diverse, and it's so amazing that how, just like, you know, we have, each have a different fingerprint. It's just like that. We're all so different from one another uh, in that sense. Okay. So, uh, 
Now let me uh, go into how can you start the process of purification. So this was basically an introduction to what the purpose of purification is and where you want, to, what your goals should be and why and what is the result of that. So I've given, you know, I'm talking fast because I have a lot to say and actually to tell you the truth, everything that I'm saying in itself is like a subject in itself. But I'm just giving uh, an overview here. Okay, so how can you start this process? So I'm going to give you a few things that will help you. So we will start with your heart, okay? So this is your palm, your heart. <coughs> now, like I said, your nafs and your jawarih, they feed the heart. Now how the heart is fed from a few places. And I'll give you some practical steps. Number one place, the heart is fed from the eyes. Hearing, or rather I would say listening, your mouth, what it does, your, your feet, and your hands. And I'm going to give you something practical you can do to begin to have your aql, what you know you need to do, have begin to have control over your heart. Now, so feelings and emotions. Now, if sins, as you know the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet said that when somebody does a sin, a black spot is put into your heart. Just like, and there is a relationship and there is not a relationship. I'm not going to go into the details of this. Just like you have the black stone. The black stone, if you sin, it becomes black and black and black and black. You're aware of this, right? So the same thing happens in the heart. The Prophet said, وسلم, when you do a sin, a black spot is put in your heart. A small black spot. If you do a good, a good thing, a white spot is put in. Our hearts mostly are a combination of the bad and the good, right? There's some white, some light, you can say and some darkness smudges on it. I will explain this in more detail if I have time. Well, I actually explain this from the Quran and in, in, in Surah Al-Nur uh, in a lot more detail. But right now I'm just going to give you this and then maybe we might go into that other parable uh, if we have time. So you do, you, you, your eyes look at a female that it, or, or, a, or, 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 or a male, depending upon if you're male or female. But you look at someone you're not supposed to, that's one dark spot. You know, you said something you're not supposed to, that's another dark spot. You went to a place uh, you're not supposed to, that's another dark spot. You did something with your hands, uh, abused somebody, that's another dark, dark spot. You were listening to too much music and you missed your prayers, that's another dark spot. So what you have to do is, you have to do two things simultaneously, which I will explain to you what they are. You have to take one month, Okay, one month, and this is just a practical thing you can do to begin to have your aql to take control of your qalb. Now, you can do this, there can be many different methods, but I'm giving you one that will, that uh, is in congruency with Islamic tradition, as well as NLP, cognitive psychology, and even classical psychology. For one month, have a journal of what you do with your eyes. Okay, and note down every time your eyes do something it's not supposed to do. Because every time you're doing something it's not supposed to do, you're putting a black spot on your heart. Okay? When you put a black spot on your heart, then you know, your, your qalb will be facing towards the things, the nafs, the I, myself. Your qalb will be taking, will be looking in the direction of your nafs. So for one month, Go ahead and try to control your, instead of like trying to be perfect every part of your body, I'm going to be perfect Muslim, it's like saying I'm going to run five miles when you've never run like even a mile. You're going to be tired the next day. So you take baby steps. So first, you start with your eyes, okay? And for one month, you notice, okay, I, I, what did I do wrong with my eyes? What did I do right with my eyes? And you notice over the days 
You want to stop looking at anything that's haram with your eyes. This is the first step. Sometimes maybe depending upon your state, like for example, uh, you know, a lot of kids are into pornography, for example. So I would say then maybe eyes should be the last step, okay, in, in the process because then that's going to take a lot of willpower to do. Uh, maybe pornography, I'll talk about another, I mean, with dealing with pornography is a whole issue in itself, which I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not talking about addictions right now, okay. I'm not talking about chronic addictions, and pornography is a chronic addiction uh, a lot of times. Uh, but let's say other than pornography, whatever your eyes are looking at, right? And you can always start no matter at what level you're at. So, uh, so we'll put addictions aside. Um, for addictions, we, uh, I, would, I would go more into things like hypnosis is what we would use in the modern days terms. But, uh, but you, there's other ways uh, that relate to purification of the heart that are similar to hypnosis in our tradition, uh, in, in the Islamic tradition. But you can take your eyes, uh, other than addictions, so this, let's say we start without addictions, right? So you look at, you don't look at what you're not supposed to look at for one month. You work on yourself, you work on yourself. And for that to happen, you first know, need to know the sayings of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that relate to particularly, because the Prophet gave, for each one of these things, the Prophet gave encouragements and sayings that would, like for example, the Prophet said, if you do not look, if you do not use your eyes for something haram, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing that you sacrificed yourself and, and kept yourself from doing something haram, Allah will show that person who keeps his eyes from doing haram, Allah will show himself to that person, will give him the, 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 the delight of seeing Allah on the Day of Judgment. So you have to know certain things that will help you in the process and encourage you in the process of basically shutting the door of this sin, okay? So this sin is putting in things here that ultimately bring it negative emotions, right? Sins bring negative emotions, which then the nafs is feeding it. This, the self is feeding it. I want it and me is feeding this. And it be, these become your negative emotions. And so for one month you work on your eyes, then one month you work on your ears, right? That's why the believers are already successful. Those people who have khushur, who have uh, humbleness in their prayers, who have subdued. And by, by the way, this perfectly fits with that ayah. Or uh, those people who have khushu for their rabb. Uh, that means that they have subdued all of their body parts. That's what it means. Khashara means to subdue. So the sinning, the sins that were going in from your ears, like listening to too much music, or, or especially listening to music to the point where you have, uh, you're not able to do the things you're supposed to do, like pray. Then you work one month on your hearing. Then you work one month on what you say with your mouth, because what is in your heart is even usually worse than what you say with your mouth and sometimes what comes out of the mouth is worse than what's in the heart too so anyway so one month you work on the mouth and you observe yourself then one month you work on your feet or actually hands would come uh, uh, like don't go to the bar this may not apply to some people and this may not apply to some people but you know, if you're a mother and you're raising children, if, you're, if you feel you hit them too much, then this would still apply to you. Or if you're a husband and you're abusing your wife, this would definitely apply to you. Um, going to the wrong places, uh, how often are you going to the things like theaters or watching, uh, doing enter too much entertain, going to places of entertainment, going to the bars, things like that. So you would spend one month training yourself not to go there or do those things. Okay? So, this is one step that you would take. Okay, now, uh, having explained this. So, when you do this, basically, you are trying to close the gates that feed your nuts. Okay, close the gates that feed me. And now. 
you close those gates, close this gate, close this gate, close this gate, close this gate. Okay, so that's the first step that you want to achieve. Okay, again, this not has to do with addictions. Addictions you're going to have to take a lot more seriously. But, uh, but then what happens also is after this, so this is, you can say, phase one is to stay away from all the harams that make your heart go black. Okay, so that's phase one. So this is what you want to do. Okay. Now, in order to get, now let me draw this again. Phase two of self-purification is to start working on, and this is not to say that you don't do this in the first phase. You have to do them simultaneously, but you're just not focusing. Just like you're, you're, you're still not sitting with your, in, if you're looking at your, if you're focusing on your eyes, doesn't mean go ahead and fo uh, do, do all the sins you want with your ears. You're, you're just focusing on your eyes and, and then uh, making notes of really what you're doing. You're being conscious. You're trying to become aware of what you're doing with your eyes while you're still trying to do everything else right at the same time. You're just not focused on it. In the same way, while you're trying to block all the ways that feed yourself, the ways that feed negative emotions and, to your, and, and dominating your nafs over your heart, because when you don't sin with your eyes, with your ears, with your mouth, with your feet, with your hand, you have blockade, done sanctions, or blocked your nafs from entering into the into the heart with those negative emotions of, hey, what do I get? What, when do I get it now? Right? You're stopping yourself. Every time you are going to look somewhere and you tell yourself no. What this process does, it makes you more aware of that, that it, instead of being an instinct where you do some things just addictively, you kick in the process of thinking, wait, I'm not supposed to do this. Which does what? Then makes your aql do more dominant. Your aql is telling you don't do this. Now you're giving your aql the ability to dominate something. Another thing, that, by the way, before I talk about phase number two, about phase number one, another way you can do that is for every day, start off every day uh, telling your, something that yourself says I want, like tea or, or chai or, or, or coffee or, or, or some sweet or I want to go do this or I want this or I want to yell at somebody. Every, every day or I want to play this game or I want to listen to this music, whatever. Every day you take something that you want to do that even Allah allows and not allow yourself just to be able to get used to uh, telling your soul, your, your, body, your animal instinct, no. It's like when you tell your dog no to train it. Same way, you have your animal instinct, you're training it, you're telling it no. Even though it's okay, but you want to train it. So to train it, you tell it no. You get used to telling your your nafs, your ego, the part that says, I'm wonderful, yes. Is it one pleasure or more than one? So I'm going to talk, so you start off with one a day, let's say for a week. The next week you might do two. Next week you might do three. Next week you might do four. Next week you might do five. This gives your willpower more control over your heart. You know, there's also another great book uh, written in the world of corporations and businesses. It's called Eat the Frog, which is also very good. Eat the frog, the idea behind the book is basically start off your day, day doing something you dread doing, right? You don't want to do it. So start off your day doing the one thing you don't want to do, and then the rest of the day will be easy for you. The one thing that you're dreading to do, or you have some anxiety to do, or some stress to do, for example, you have to have a meeting with someone, and you're really dreading it. You don't want to have this meeting with this person because you think they're going to criticize you, for example, or whatever it is. Go ahead and have that meeting first. Start off your day crushing your ego. Start off your day crushing your ego and doing something you don't want to do because for the rest of the day you'll feel in control and your aqlan will have control over your nafs again. So uh, so those are three methods but the, but I definitely want to focus on the method that I talked about the most that you focus on your eyes because these are the ways sins go into us and then you can further supplement your, your strength and your willpower and your aqlan. What do you do with your knowledge? And this is what aql means. What do you do with your knowledge? Jahil has knowledge. He has no control, and he just uh, he's he's just emotional. He has no control over his his knowledge and his intellect. So, um, having said that, now the second phase is to now focus when you have closed all the doors 
of sins into your heart. Now you want to ultimately do two, uh, phase two is going to now be you take your heart and your aql. And to put it uh, easy or a simple way to understand it is you're not only focusing now on the fara'id. You're not focusing only on the obligatory actions. Okay, Now you start focusing on more and more on your goal now at this level, at the higher level. Now you've closed all the doors right, to sin. So you've closed the doors to sin. Now you want to feed your... your so now you're going to feed the ruh. You're going to open the doors for the ruh by doing what? Two things. Uh, number one is going to be to be following as much of the sunnah of the Prophet. So the fard is understood. Fard and sunnah. So fard and sunnah equal trying to become like a, uh, for lack of a better word, a mini Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You can say not even a mini Muhammad, but rather a shadow of the shadow of the shadow. You know, the Prophet has his shadow, you can say, uh, and then that shadow of that shadow, okay? So you're trying to become something that uh, looks like him and his character, the positive, uh, further enhancing yourself with the sunnahs of the Prophet. And one thing that's very important at this level is love of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa love of the Prophet. So now uh, you now put in that light. You're praying five times a day. You're trying to follow every sunnah. You're trying to wake up for tahajjud. Again, this has different phases in it. I'm now summarizing again where you want to be. But the other thing that you want to do in addition to that is how do you feed your ruh? Okay, how do you feed your ruh? Is through Quran. Because Quran calls itself ruh. Okay, so you feed the ruh, you clean the heart, and you give willpower to your aql to control your heart and bring in it positive emotions. So there are three things you're doing. You're feeding it Quran, which is from that world where the ruh is. Quran is from the other world. Revealed on the heart of the Prophet, the Ruh of the Prophet Sallallahu Okay? The Ruh, in fact, the angels are also called Ruh in Quran. Ruh al-Qudus, for example. And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala refers to His own Ruh. So this is all things referring to the Alim al-Amr, the world, the other world. You can turn it off. 